So recently, I came across some new information concerning Lucy Letby. Now, this includes Lucy Letby's prison move just days before her trial began, and the subsequent psychological impact that that apparently had on her. We'll also be taking a more in-depth look into Lucy Letby the individual, and who she was before this trial began. Now, during parts of this video, I'm also going to be stopping and sharing some of my own opinions on the article itself. For a woman accused of such grave crimes, Lucy Letby cut an almost pitiable figure in the witness box of Manchester Crown Court. Clutching a fluffy purple comforter out of sight of the jury, the nurse dissolved into tears at reminders of her home life. The 33-year-old wept at any mention of her cat's tigger and smudge, and sobbed when the court saw a photograph of her childlike bedroom with four fluffy toys laid across her sweet dreams duvet, fairy lights on her bed frame, and art saying, leave sparkles wherever you go, pinned to the wall. Her tears at these points were in sharp contrast to her expressionless, impassive demeanour when the details of her alleged crimes were presented to the jury. The description by the prosecutor Nicholas Johnson Casey of Letby as a cold, calculated, cruel and relentless killer was almost word for word the phrase used by the judge who sentenced Myra Hindley for the Moores murders more than 50 years ago. It was said of Hindley and Rose West that what made their crimes all the more shocking was that these women were so ordinary. Letby was the epitome of ordinary. She appeared conventional in every way. DCI Nicola Evans, who spent six years analysing Letby as part of the police investigation, described her in one word, beige. There isn't anything outstanding or outrageous that we found about her as a person, Evans said. She was an average nurse. She was what you would say is a normal 20-something-year-old, but clearly there was another side of that that nobody saw, and that we have unravelled during this investigation. Okay, so I'm just going to cut in here very briefly and just share some of my own thoughts regarding what we've just read there. Quote, There isn't anything outstanding or outrageous that we found out about her as a person. She was an average nurse. And I think this is quite a sticking point for a lot of people. And I have to be honest, it has stuck with me or shocked me quite a bit that since Lucy Letby's conviction, there has been literally no one who has come forward to say, oh yeah, yeah, this person was a little bit strange, or I'm the ex-boyfriend, or um, I used to know Lucy as a child, and this was a little bit strange, this was a little bit odd. When we compare this to similar cases such as Beverly Allett, on the face of things, they may appear basically quite normal, but then you'll have people come forward with stories, and, you know, this was wrong, or this person was underqualified for the role that they were carrying out, or this person demonstrated this bizarre behaviour. But with Lucy Letby, there has been nothing, absolutely zero. And I do find that, A, quite interesting, and B, as I say, quite shocking. Now, you can tell that the mainstream media, particularly the Daily Mail, are absolutely desperate for any kind of news, any kind of dirt, any kind of history of Lucy Letby. That was told, really around about four or five days ago, when in their newspaper they had exclusive Lucy Letby's best friend talks, blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't this um, it wasn't this young lady who appeared on Panorama, it was someone else. It was actually the friend of Lucy Letby, who I saw in court, who would accompany her parents um, to court every day. And basically what the reporter had done was knock on the door, the friend opens the door, and literally... They said, do you believe that Lucy Letby's um, still innocent? And she said, yes, I do. I believe she's innocent. And she wouldn't elaborate any further and shut the door. But they made it out to be this, you know, all exclusive, you know, friend interview. And it was literally her friend opening the door, saying, yes, I believe she's still innocent and closing it again. And that was a, a full page article in the Daily Mail. So they are desperate absolutely desperate for any bit of information, any bit of dirt, any bit of background information, but there isn't any, and I do find that incredibly bizarre. What is also interesting is that none of her colleagues, none of her nursing colleagues, have come forward with stories of, yes, we had suspicions about Lucy. I mean, yes, there was one lady who came forward the day of the convictions and said, 
oh, we had a name for her, the Angel of Death, I think it was. But, I mean, she's disappeared. We haven't heard from the nurses who gave evidence in court. Yet we've heard from Dr. Breary, Dr. Ravi Jayram, who have appeared on basically anything that they can get on, really. ITV, BBC, Sky News. Um, that's no criticism, by the way. It's just to say that they have appeared on a lot of platforms. Yet the people who actually work closely with her, as in her nursing colleagues, they are nowhere to be found. Yet they appeared in court giving evidence against Lucy Letby or evidence to the case. And they are completely and utterly silent. You would have thought that some of them would have come forward and said, oh, yeah, 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 we had suspicions very early on. This was wrong. Lucy would do this. Lucy would do that. But there is nothing. And this silence, this kind of grabbing for information and putting out there whatever they can find, really does tell you that there doesn't appear to be anything in Lucy Letby's background. Or even, to some degree, at her workplace, at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Where are the colleagues? I mean, you could say, well, maybe they've been told not to speak. But then surely that would apply also to Dr. Breary and Dr. Jayram. But as I say, they've appeared on multiple platforms and given many, many interviews. Anyway, let's continue on with this article here. Let me lived alone in a semi-detached home in the cathedral city of Chester in northwest England, on a quiet street of neat lawns and privet hedges. Her parents, who lived a couple of hours south in Hereford, had helped Letby buy the smart three-bedroom house. It was a mile from the Countess of Chester Hospital where she worked and the pokey staff digs where she had lived until then. Letby decorated her home with chintzy wall art, quote, happy Prosecco season and friends are angels in disguise. In the kitchen, she had a happy birthday mummy note pinned to the wall from her cat, written by her mother. Another note read, Number one godmother awarded to Lucy Letby. She was a fastidious diary keeper, writing down work shifts in blue ink and social engagements in pink, ticking off items she had completed, including the delivery of a washing machine. Letby went to the gym, did salsa classes most weeks, and had quite an active social life, she told jurors. But her life appeared to revolve around her work. She often volunteered for overtime and regularly worked weekends. She was quietly popular among some of her fellow nurses, two of whom she counted as best friends. It was her own little family, she said. She was once chosen as the face of a fundraising campaign by the Nursing and Midwifery Council and appeared on a poster. She featured in the Chester Standard several times as part of the newspaper's support for the Baby Grow Appeal, aimed at raising £3 million to build a new neonatal unit at the hospital. In 2013, she was the subject of a short interview about her job, in which she told the newspaper, quote, I hope the new unit will provide a greater degree of privacy and space for parents and siblings. To others, she was unremarkable. One senior colleague said about Letby, she didn't stand out as a particularly bad nurse, she didn't stand out as a particularly good one. Arian Powell, however, was fond of Letby, and unlike some colleagues, judged her an exceptional nurse who was extraordinarily hard-working, flexible and committed. She was very particular with her attention to detail, she said. Letby grew up in a pleasant, middle-class neighbourhood in Hereford. She went to the comprehensive Aylstone School up to the age of 16, followed by Hereford Sixth Form College. Her parents, John and Susan Letby, clearly doted on her. She was their only child and the first in the family to go to university. Letby returned to her childhood home after she was arrested. A neighbour in Hereford said the local community had offered support to her parents where they could. Neighbours were surprised and just felt very sad for the Letbys, including Lucy, he added. Detectives admit they may never know what turned this beige young nurse into a killer. This is a completely unprecedented situation, in that there doesn't seem to be anything to say that explains why she has committed these crimes. Being average has allowed her to go under the radar, and it's allowed her to operate in plain sight. It's allowed her to abuse people's trust because nobody is looking at her. She is normal and average, and she doesn't stand out in the crowd. She used that to abuse the trust of so many people around her. 
Netby's mother and father attended every day of her 10-month trial, decamping from home to stay near Manchester where the trial was held. She tried to make eye contact with them in the public gallery, occasionally exchanging smiles. Her parents, who still work for the family's radiator business, occasionally reproached journalists in court for what they felt was unfair coverage. Letby seemed particularly close to her father. Documents seen by The Guardian show he forcefully defended her when executives at the Countess of Chester Hospital removed her from the neonatal unit in July 2016 after the death of two triplet boys. John Letby was convinced of his daughter's innocence and received the backing of Tony Chambers, the hospital's chief executive, who decided that Letby should be allowed to return to the unit in January 2017. When paediatric consultants angry complained about his decision, Letby's father threatened to refer them to the General Medical Council. They were forced to write her a letter of apology, but maintained that she should not be allowed to return to the unit. She was arrested little more than a year later, on July the 4th, 2018, and her father was there to witness it. It was 6am on a clear blue July morning when Letby opened the door to a Cheshire police detective. Her instinctive smile dropped when the officer introduced himself. Letby was led out of her Chester home in handcuffs 11 minutes later, looking ashen-faced, dressed in her nighty and a blue Lee Cooper tracksuit. Lucy Letby had been reading two books when Cheshire Constabulary's investigation caught up with her. One was Never Greener by Ruth Jones, a novel about two people swept up in an adulterous affair, the other In Shock by Dr Rana a memoir by a doctor who suffered a hemorrhage when seven months pregnant, losing her first unborn child and having to spend months in the hospital where she worked. The next time Letby would see her bedroom was five years later in police photographs shown in court. Letby had decided fairly early that she wanted to work with children and after college studied nursing at the University of Chester. She was known to be studious with a close circle of friends whom she continued to see before her arrest. She qualified as a Band 5 nurse in September 2011 when she was 21, meaning she was able to care for babies in intensive care. When she started working at the Countess of Chester Hospital the following year, she was often placed with the most vulnerable babies in Nursery 1, the intensive care room. Letby had been in custody for almost two years when her trial began in October 2022. The case was thrown into doubt on the first day when it emerged that she had moved prisons days before, leaving many of her possessions and medication behind, and had found it, quote, highly damaging and traumatising. Her barrister, Benjamin Myers Casey, said Letby was so shaken by the experience she was disorientated as a result, quote, Incoherent, she can't speak properly, and it had blown away any progress she had been making psychologically. The trial eventually got underway a week behind schedule after Letby was assessed by a psychiatrist. OK, I'll just cut in here very briefly. Now, this is quite interesting because I don't remember there being a one-week delay in the start of this trial. But then bearing in mind... I think it just sort of appeared in the Chester Standard or the proceedings just started appearing in the press. So maybe this wasn't actually announced to the public. Maybe this was just something that took place behind closed doors and there was in fact a one week delay. Now what makes sense in what I've just read to you there is that we do know that Lucy Letby had to change prisons on more than one occasion. And obviously because the trial is taking place in Manchester, they did move her to one which was within travelling distance, you know, or fairly close to Manchester Crown Court. So that does make sense, the fact that she had to move prisons before the trial began. So, yeah, that does sound quite quite credible. Also, what lends some, I guess, validity to what I've just stated there is the fact that Benjamin Myers Casey, Lucy Letby's defence barrister, did mention in court that Lucy was on a number of medications. These were sleeping tablets, and from memory, I think it was antidepressants, it might have been some kind of anti-anxiety drug, but from memory, I'm sure he said she's on sleeping tablets and she can't sleep at all without them, and also some form of antidepressant. Now, I guess there is multiple ways in which you could look at that situation. You could say, well, this is Lucy Letby wanting to gain control of the process of doing things in her time when she's ready and she's simply delaying the trial taking place. 
or maybe there were, as I say, some psychological issues. But again here, it does mention that the trial eventually got underway a week behind schedule after Letby was assessed by psychiatrists. And that's another question that people have had. Um, was she actually assessed by anyone, any kind of medical professional? And it does appear here that she has indeed been assessed by a psychiatrist, or she was before this trial took place. Anyway, let's continue on with the article. In her first few days in the witness box, she looked on edge. Her eyes darted nervously towards any unexpected noise. A cough, a dropped pen, or when the female prison guard beside her shuffled in her seat. She blinked rapidly. Right, I'm going to cut in here. So it's been mentioned here, and this is something that I covered in a previous video. Now, bearing in mind, I was in court for Lucy Letby's cross-examination. And in one of my previous videos, I think it's titled My Experience in Court with Lucy Letby. I've done three or four of these type of videos, but you can find them on the channel if you want to look. And in that video, I said, what stood out to me about Lucy Letby physically was this rapid blinking. And I don't just mean someone blinking rapidly, but it was like really, really noticeable. And it's interesting here that it's being picked up upon during this particular article. I'll just read this to you again. In her first few days in the witness box, she looked on edge. Her eyes darted nervously towards any unexpected noise. A cough, a drop pen, or when the female prison guard beside her shuffled in her seat. She blinked rapidly. Another thing that I've noticed as well, another thing that I noticed during that time period, was this sort of darting around of her eyes and her head. So it's kind of touched upon there, but it was mainly evident if someone was like coughing, if there was a cough from like a member of the jury or a barrister or someone else, and there was, you know, there's, there's a few people coughing every now and again, her eyes and her head were just sort of darting that direction. So yeah, probably someone who you would class as very easily startled. Anyway, let's continue on with the article here. The defendant holding her comforter told jurors she was easily startled and easily scared as a result of her traumatising arrests, for which she had been diagnosed with PTSD. She also took medication for depression and anxiety. Under 11 days of cross-examination, her attention to detail became apparent. She occasionally pointed out ambiguities in medical evidence, which she would read most nights in her cell. She responded haughtily to Johnson's questioning, swatting down his remarks while staring straight ahead at the jury, never looking him in the eye. Right, I don't know about you, but I had to Google haughtily. Never heard of it before. Haughtily is uh, in an unfriendly way and seeming to consider yourself better than other people. Very interesting, very interesting, because this goes back to the video that I made yesterday. Please don't look at Lucy Letby as this quiet, reserved individual just sort of whispering on the stand, you know, this victim sort of mentality. That's not her. She was very able to stand up for herself, very able to articulate herself, very able and willing, I should say, very willing to point out any inconsistencies, um, even override and overall nurses who had like 10 years more experience than herself. She was able to... Um, you know, respond to the prosecuting barrister with confidence. And, you know, as it says there, haughtily, that means in an unfriendly way and seeming to consider yourself better than other people. That kind of was her demeanour in a lot of ways. Very confident. And what was it that I said yesterday in yesterday's video? When I said about this, um, this note that she wrote, wasn't it? The note, which is um, quite an interesting piece of the evidence, said um, to triplet one, two and three, today's your birthday, but you aren't here. And I'm so sorry for that. Now, the reason why that note was so important was because one of the babies was still alive. So the prosecuting barrister is saying, why have you addressed it to all three of them when one of them is still alive? It's almost as if you're writing out a mock sympathy card. You know what I mean? And she said, oh, I can't answer that. And I guess that's the way I presented that yesterday. That is how she spoke. And haughtily, that's the best way of describing it, haughtily. I can't answer that. Just like that. Sort of a little bit of arrogance to it, I suppose. Anyway, let's continue on and finish off this article here. Let me perhaps looked most uncomfortable when she was being asked about a senior doctor with whom the prosecutor suggested she was having an affair. She collapsed in tears halfway through the trial when the married doctor, who cannot be named, came into court to give evidence for the prosecution. 
Let be told jurors he had been her best friend, although she had not worked with him for long. His name was written on scrawled notes recovered from Letby's bedroom, alongside lyrics to a Craig David song that read, Love was all we needed, but time let us down. The pair regularly exchanged Facebook messages, went for meals and walks, and he visited her home. After Letby was removed from the neonatal unit amid suspicions about her connection to unexplained deaths, she and the doctor went on a day trip to London and continued to meet regularly, exchanging text messages with love hearts. He did not know it, but she had searched for his wife on Facebook. The nature of their relationship was said to be significant. He was one of the doctors who would be called when babies suddenly deteriorated. OK, just going to cut in here very briefly, just to touch upon the topic of Dr A, as many people have been commenting regarding this. Now, I covered this in some detail in previous videos regarding the text message exchanges which were shown in court. And so many people have said, oh, this Dr. A thing doesn't mean anything. Many people have affairs, you know, all this bloody crap. So I thought I'd, um, you know, just give you some insight or my own personal opinion on why the Dr. A situation between himself and Lucy Lepley was quite important to the prosecution. I don't believe it's anything to do with, you know, an affair or attention, anything like that. I mean, you've got these psychologists now who are popping up on YouTube and they're saying, um, you know, with throwing out these sort of cookie cutter responses about um, attention and this is why she did it to get the attention of this doctor and it's even kind of alluded to in this particular article and I don't buy into that for one moment it really strikes me people who start saying this because they clearly haven't been following the trial Dr A wasn't even working at the Countess of Chester Hospital when these attacks started from memory, I don't believe he started working there until around about halfway through these charges. So you can forget that as the original motivating factor for these attacks. I mean, maybe over time it morphed into some sort of, you know, I want attention from this doctor and I can get it by doing this, that and the other. Maybe it morphed into that. But it certainly wasn't the initial or original motivation for Lucy Letby to attack these children. Back to the situation with Dr. A. Why do I believe that the prosecution kept going on about it, kept bringing it up and asking her questions about, you know, text messages and when they went out together? So just to get a, give a bit of clarity to this, on the last day of Lucy Letby's cross-examination, um, we had all of her social life and there were dates written in her diary when she was going out shopping with this guy, going out for meals, um, going to London, uh, trips away. Uh, going for walks, he was going out around her house, and then he'd he'd message her like, "Oh, you know, you poor little thing, would you like to borrow my car?" And, and uh, you know, so many people say that she was chasing him, but that's not the impression I got at all. I feel that she had him on a piece of string, and he just came across like this sort of knight in shining armor, you know, trying to save the helpless victim. But for me, why the prosecution prosecution used this Doctor A situation was to kind of poke holes in the credibility of Lucy Letby. Because one instance, or one situation that stands out to me in particular, is when Lucy Letby is messaging one of her colleagues, and her colleague says, oh, does he want you to go commando? Now, I'm sorry, but pretty much everybody knows what go commando means, you know? Don't wear any pants or whatever. And Nicholas Johnson said to Lucy Letby, what does she mean by that? You know, why, why is she asking you to go commando? She said, I don't know. And then he said, do you know what go commando means? And then she said, no. And it wasn't as if in a text message she said, what do you mean? Like she clearly, she clearly knew what go commando means. Everybody, the vast majority of people know what that means. And she said, no, no, I don't know what that means. No, no, I've got no idea. And then he moves on to these text messages. And over time, you're getting this, you know, this, this stream of information, this building up. It's not just all thrown at you at what, in one moment. He might just touch upon this for a little while and then go off into another area of the case. And then maybe the day later, OK, we're going to bring up some text messages now between you and Dr. A. And then they start, you know, the text messages. They've got love hearts and they're going out on these um, shopping trips together, restaurant, you know, meals, uh, walks and trips away. Still not your boyfriend? No, still not your boyfriend, you know, asking this question. And really, I think what it, the reason why they did this was because the, the, the jury must have been looking at her and thinking, everything that they're showing is pointing to you having something to do with this doctor and you keep denying it. So therefore, it's giving the air of dishonesty. 
And I would have thought that the jury may have been thinking at that point in time, if we can't trust you with what you're saying here, you've got no idea what Go Commando means. You've got all of this circumstantial evidence about something happening between you and this doctor, even your friends saying you're flirting with each other. You're going out for shopping dates, you know, um, meals, trips away. And this is a married man, by the way. And the jury must have been looking at her thinking, how credible are you? And I think it just came down to like a bit of a credibility contest. And they were trying to really poke holes in Lucy Let Be The Individual, making her out or showing her to be potentially an absolute liar. And I think that that worked in the prosecution's favour in a lot of ways, because as I said, Lucy Let becomes across as a very, very convincing individual, probably the most convincing liar I have ever been in the presence of or who are, that I've ever witnessed in my life, I have to be honest. And I think that that was a tactic used by the, the prosecution to um, bring her down a peg or two, I guess is the best way to describe it, and raise some questions in the jury's mind about who they were really looking at on the witness stand. Okay, so back to the article here. She harmed them, it was suggested, during the trial to get his personal attention. Under cross-examination, Letby appeared to say she had a boyfriend, but this came during a period of intense questioning about the married doctor with whom she denied having an affair. Again, refer to my previous video that I made as I was in court this day for this particular exchange. He was talking about her job. You had a good job? She said yes. It allowed you to buy a car? Yes. Allowed you to buy a house? Yes. You had a boyfriend? Yes, she said. That was literally what she said. Anyways, carry on. It was not suggested that she was in a relationship with anyone else at this time, and no previous partners were mentioned during the trial. That's quite interesting. Asked why their contact had dried up in early 2017, Letby told her barrister it had simply fizzled out. The weakness of Letby's defence was exposed when she failed to produce any medical expert, colleague, family member or friend to testify on her behalf. The only witness called by her legal team was a hospital plumber, who looked as bewildered by his presence in court as those watching on. Lorenzo Mansuti, who had worked at the Countess of Chester since before Letby was born, was in the witness box for 25 minutes, before the defendant's barrister said at 11.36am on day 129 of the trial, that's the case for Miss Letby. In the dock, Letby looked on impassively. As always, many thanks for joining me for this video. If you are new to the channel, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe down below for future content regarding this case. And very shortly, you'll be able to see the Lucy Letby playlist, which has all of the videos I've created regarding the trial and the case of Lucy Letby, all in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.